The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Salutations. Welcome to Compass. I'm Laura K. Prosser, producer of Compass, and this is a weekly Pioneer production that covers regional issues and topics in our viewing area. This week, however, we are shaking things up a bit. I'm taking over for Les Heen, our host, and I'm taking you in the field and around FarmFest in Morgan, Minnesota. So let's go take a look, shall we? So, when you're coming to a Minnesota Farm Fest, what sure. are some of the things you're thinking about preparing for? Yeah, so it, it, lots of things. I mean, it, obviously, as the National Farmers Union perspective, it, you know, president, I have a national per perspective. But my most of my life I spent in North Dakota. I was a farmer and rancher there, uh, and it's only the last seven, eight years I've been out in D.C. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I kind of, this is kind of like coming home for me. Uh, and I'll tell you what folks are talking to me about is the low prices really? and the need for a safety net and the need to sort of focus on this next farm bill and let's make sure that we have a safety net that's really going to work so that when these prices are as bad as they are, that farmers are going to be able to survive to farm another year. There are ostensibly two principal reasons for having uh, farm program support for farmers. Uh, and, and the public has an interest in these because the public obviously wants to eat. Farmers are the folks that produce the food. That's okay? very true. So the reasons, there are two big risks that farmers face. Really? One is when the markets collapse because farmers have really no control over what they're going to get for the, the corn they sell or the soybeans they sell or the, the animals they sell. That price is determined externally by other market forces. Okay? okay. So that's one risk. So when the market price is below cost of production, we need some sort of a price-based safety net to help folks so they can at least get close to breaking even so they can survive to farm another year. The other big risk that farmers face is sort of weather disaster related risks and uh, over the years we've had a number of different disaster programs to help when major weather events come in. They are not particularly uh, focused. I mean, it's difficult to get them passed through Congress. And so over the years, we've gradually gravitated toward a stronger and stronger crop insurance program that covers more and more kinds of risks in different ways. That's very good because it gives farmers some predictability in terms of what's going to happen if, the, you know, if things really go south. Um, if a major storm event comes through, wipes out their crops. Um, if a drought comes through, wipes out their crops, whatever, yeah. uh, there is sort of this all-risk crop insurance program that's okay. that's there. So those two, those two big fundamental things, those risks, are what farmers need protection from, and that that's an important part of the farm bill. And there's lots of other pieces to it, but that's what farmers pay attention to. So we're talking about farmer protection. What yeah. kind of farm safety is being done at a regional level right sure. now? But there are lots of injuries and deaths in agriculture, and so uh, we actually just uh, this uh, couple months ago mm -hmm. released a series of farm safety videos that are available on our on our website wow. that can be downloaded or we can send CDs or USB you know sticks and that kind of stuff and there's even a financial aspect of this that's important because farmers get injured or they get killed on the job uh, somebody ends up most often those are insurable events insurance companies pay out indemnities so you know they can help fund some of these things to prevent those things that helps their bottom line too so there are lots of good reasons for us to be doing it well I'm with Carol Freer 
Curry. She's the Quibolife CEO who works with farmers with disabilities, getting them farming and the right equipment. Correct, Carol? That's right. Thank you for inviting us today. Equipolife is a statewide nonprofit, and we provide services to people with disabilities. One of our specialty programs is called Agribility. We're here at Farm Fest, um, talking to visitors and people who are interested in learning more about how do I help a person who's a farmer with a disability? And how do you do that? First thing we do is we will go out to the person's farm or home where they have a hobby farm and begin the conversation of what can we help you with? What are the priorities that you have? What are your issues? What struggles and are you having? What are the struggles? What are the barriers that interfere with your ability to keep going in the direction that you would like to go in your production? We take a look at what kind of equipment can we put in place to help remove that barrier. For example, um, a person who uses a wheelchair, we would go and ask them what type of equipment they're using, and if it's primarily one single tractor, we would work with that person to help find a very specific lift to help lift them up get in them their wheelchair it. and get into that um, tractor. Equipment isn't cheap, so it's, how, do you, very how true. do you adapt this equipment? We provide low interest loans that are guaranteed uh, to help people who need to purchase more expensive equipment. Uh, we also pool resources. So we might have funding from vocational rehab, okay. funding from um, their own personal dollars, and then some of the money from our low interest loan program. Um, we guarantee those loans on many occasions. We have grant programs uh, for people who are unable to afford a loan. Really? Um, we don't turn people away. Wonderful. We figure out a financial solution. As we came to the last farm bill, it was the people in this room together that we wrote that farm bill. The farm bill is really not doing as good a job of putting in a safety net as um, they like. So they're looking at different ways that we can put some kind of a floor underneath these prices. That's the main thing. Basically, my position is that we should have a floor kind of at a break-even point on these crops and that the price can't go below that floor and then use um, what you actually plant as the basis for that, which is different than what's currently in the farm bill. So um, we'll have to see how we work through all of that. Is there anything else different on the farm bill this year that... Well, they've been after crop insurance trying to screw that up, and so that's probably the most important thing for farmers because they go in and buy coverage to, in case their crop uh, fails, you know, for drought or floods, or you know, they also need to buy some price protection. And so this is an important thing not only for the farmer but for the bankers because the banker wants to get paid back. So he's going to make sure the farmer has crop insurance. So we want to make sure that that's still available to. Um, Farmers. But the underlying thing I always think about when I come to these shows is farmers need a price to make this economy go. Today, in today's economy, farmers are suffering on a price. I know dairy farmers today that are losing $1,000 a week because we don't have, and we didn't get it right in a margin protection program, which is a insurance program, so they could buy their protection. The issue ended up being that program didn't work. So policy and price for farm programs is terribly important. You need to have a crop insurance program to number one protect and to make sure there's another crop coming. You can't go it alone in farming. Uh, the other part of it, we have food, fiber, and a fuel policy in this country and the fabric of that food, fiber, and fuel policy is family farmers. That's what we need to protect. And when I come to these areas, come to these things, we need to really make sure that the policy fits our farmers in not only Minnesota, but all of the country. You touched on pricing. What can farmers expect in the next year or so? Well, you have to have a cost of production. Farmers can't control the cost of production. And we get a lot of regulations throw at us. And sometimes those regulations are well intended. Uh, they're looking for clean water, clean air, a clean environment, and also healthy food. And we really have no ability to control our prices because we're buying retail both ways on the farm. So I might suggest very strongly that, you know, is there the potential of having a surcharge for environmental regulations that would help farmers meet 
those new requirements that would ensure clean water, clean air, and safe and healthy food. Right now, we're going alone, and frankly, the people that are winning on that are the consumers and the people that buy the food from us. When you're going alone, how does that open the door for corporate egg to come into farms? In other states, not Minnesota, we have an anti-corporate farm law. It's a family corporation that you're protected. But in other states, they don't have that. So then large corporations that own the dirt to the dinner plate on food, then they will own farming. And that whole fabric of being able to control the price and cost of food to consumers, that will disappear. As well as I'm standing here, that will disappear and you will be paying high prices for food. One of the uh, big issues for Governor, Governor Dayton and the administration is to focus on water and water quality issues. He talks uh, at length about uh, this being uh, a year of water and that we need to establish, if we haven't already, we certainly need to establish a water ethic in Minnesota. And so uh, it is with that message that we've been moving forward uh, at the department, more specifically on something we titled Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification. Farmers have for a long time indicated that, hey, look, we're, we're doing it. We're doing it on the land. And we're saying, well, then you should be acknowledged for the good work that you're doing. Uh, so let's see if we can put together a program that we can certify you on the farm as establishing all of the best management practices available, uh, put together by our own University of Minnesota, uh, establish that on the farm, uh, get your score up with our uh, measuring tool to 8.5 or better, and we can certify your farm as Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certified. For that, you get 10 years of certainty. So how hard is it to qualify an 8.5? Uh, you will, you, we look at the whole farm, uh, and it's not the easiest thing, the bar is pretty high, uh, but we've already certified over 100,000 acres, over 140 farms in Minnesota. Uh, when, that, uh, when we utilize the model to determine soil loss, we've saved significant amount of soil going into the waterways, we've reduced uh, phosphorus, we've reduced nitrogen in waterways, and that makes our state a much better state. So now, how long has the certification been in place? We've been going uh, year-round for one year now, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, statewide. We've been going statewide for one full year. Uh, we're hoping to ramp that up. Uh, we do water quality in Minnesota acre by acre. It's a long process, but as long as the trajectory is sort of going up, we're on the right track. So as you're ramping it up this year, what kind of goes into ramping up the certificate? Making sure that we certify and train those folks that will go out and sit down at the kitchen table with farmers that have an interest in becoming certified. It's a voluntary program. We have at this point about 400 farmers that are waiting in the queue uh, to become certified. And so the only thing that holds us back are people that are able to sit down with farmers at the kitchen table and go over their program. Uh, many of the farm groups came together here this past uh, biennium and they brought forth a legislative proposal to fund uh, uh, research at the University of Minnesota really? for uh, production, uh, farm productivity. And uh, when it was all said and done, um, the state on the bottom line, we have about 17 million going to the University of Minnesota wow. long term. And uh, I just spoke with uh, last night with President Kaler and uh, Dean Brian Boer of the St. Paul campus. And uh, they have been working very hard to, to put this into action. And like uh, Dean Boer said, he said it's been very fun working with all the commodity groups, all the productions and producers, you know, production groups. So, so that's been fun. That's been uh, a great initiative. So how difficult is it to get all these groups together working on one topic, one issue? Well, this was their idea. And so they took it upon themselves to, to do this and we're seeing more and more of that um, you know I've said in the past that agriculture does a great job providing the consumer with a safe wholesome great tasting product yeah. at affordable price but we've struggled when it um, comes to educating the consumer on who we are and what we do and why 
And so you're seeing a much more collaborative effort through all the organizations to work together, not only on uh, production issues and agriculture issues, but on environmental issues and things like that. So what are some hot topics that these collaborations are touching on besides the one you just mentioned? Well, uh, in addition to that, um, we also focused on uh, what, what's uh, called emerging diseases. Okay. Um, we've had the recent outbreak with avian influenza, and what was uh, that was very devastating, yeah. obviously. Um, however, what was refreshing is to see all the groups come together. Um, the Department of Agriculture, yep. uh, with uh, Senator, or excuse me, uh, Commissioner Fredrickson, did a fantastic job. Um, we just talked to did Commissioner, yeah. You know, and uh, his entire group are they're the best. And one of our directives from the legislature to um, the department and the Board of Animal Health was to um, to make sure that they could replicate um, what they've done uh, with avian influenza uh, because that won't it wasn't the first and it won't be no. the last um, um, disease outbreak. to outbreak right and so uh, you know if there's uh, make sure that we're all set up in case there's something in cattle or swine or whatever the case may be and uh, the University of Minnesota and has been a, a key partner in that as well so now education about issues such as these two issues why is it important to spread education about this? You know, a lot of people know these issues, but they might not know solutions or they might not know, you know, what to do about it. So, well, what kind of impact does you know, spreading I, that? You know, and I'm really glad you asked that question because, um, again, it's every one of our, uh, our responsibility, every one of us uh, to tell our stories and to educate the consumer. And, and what you're seeing right now is there's an unfair um, uh, portrayal, uh, if you will, of, uh, of agriculture. Yeah. And so people start demonizing ag and, and they want to pit one segment of agriculture against the other. And that's, you know, that's simply not, uh, not right nor fair. I mean, we have to double the world's food supply in, in 35 short years and we're going to have to embrace high yielding technologies and there's room for all of us. There's absolutely room for all of us in ag. And, and so we need to um, uh, come together. Uh, be united, uh, get happy the word family. out, one big happy family, <laughs> absolutely, get the word out there and again educate the consumers all across uh, not only the country but the world. These businesses come from all over the five state region, even further than that. We hosted an exhibitor reception on Monday night which was a lot of fun and you got to interact with them and thank them for coming. Um, but it gives the business community an opportunity to meet with their potential customers and to show them their latest technologies and they're here to learn and hopefully purchase. Wonderful. As a business, what kind of impact do you see here? Well, it, it is, like I said before, it's a great time to get out and meet the people. That's always nice. Um, our business has been around since 1978. We're like 35 wow. years old. It's been a while, and it was started in a rural community just to service co uh, uh, agricultural customers. Uh, my parents felt that there was a need for it, and it's 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 been great. And we're there to you know serve customers. And the egg community around here has a huge impact on the area here in, in total. Mm -hmm. So whatever happens to them directly relates to every other business that's in the area. So speaking of the egg impact, what kind of economic impact does Farm Fest or just the businesses that come through and meet and greet these people? What kind of economic impact do they have? Well, from a tourism or hotel perspective, it's huge. Um, I know that the exhibitors here are traveling as far as New Alm, Marshall, Wilmer, Redwood, maybe some even Wyndham, um, to accommodate the number of hotel rooms that are required just to house the exhibitors, let alone the guests who may come and attend more than one day. Yeah. Um, and so that impact is huge for the local economy from gas stations, hotels, restaurants, that type of thing. Um, as far as the actual number, uh, with, I've never had that disclosed to me. But the, <laughs> I'm not sure. the attendance here generally in the past is about thirty-five to 40,000 people that that's attend crazy. over the three days. Yeah. So that's big. So what, what kind of impact though do people see um, you know, when they attend a business, what kind of business do you get from, from an that. event yeah. like this? Yeah. Well, for us, you know, we are located actually right here in this region in Sleepy Eye and Morgan. It actually gives us an ability to be meeting and talking with people that are locally, as well as outstate Minnesota, but as well as out of state Minnesota. So, it, you know, it offers um, us a chance to get out, you know, what can be done by local people as well as things that are available to those in other areas, especially with renewable energy. Wonderful. So tell me a little bit about renewable energy. I'm sure, sure that's a hot topic yeah, today at Farm Fest. We, we've been doing uh, renewable energy, solar PV in particular, for about the last 10 years. 
and the solar market is really just, you know, it's just on that in steady incline, which is great to see. Um, the one thing I tell a lot of people, you know, every, being as far fest or most people in the farming community come out here is, you know, you can look at farming a couple different ways. One is, you know, maybe livestock or maybe grain. Another way is to be looking at the solar energy and instead of mm -hmm. harvesting the grain, you can actually harvest the sun. And being really? the, 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 doing the same thing, it's an economic benefit to them and we're able to keep things local with Minnesota made products. Wonderful. And how we tie into that is we work then through the grant process to apply for the USDA REAP funds and there's some other tax credit programs mm -hmm. out there too that egg businesses or any business could apply for and hook them up with some additional tax savings. Well, Kevin, why don't you tell me a little bit about some of the tax issues that are going on this year? Well, probably one of our top priorities for this legislative session was property tax reforms. You know, ag property pays a disproportionate share of the property tax. When you're paying uh, thousands of dollars in property tax, and it's not just farmers it's that own land, it's also rent because it's all landowners. So it's so important that, that becomes part of the land rent. Um, as we're seeing lower prices, there's certainly more financial stress on the farm now with lower prices, lower margins, and just being able to lower that tax bill would be very helpful. 1% of the population is feeding 100% plus in, in the world. We need to make our case. I'm sure don't. not all our viewers understand what kind of financial stress that people are under. So I know that's a big topic for the farmers here. Well, farming, farming is all about the weather. And if you have great weather, you have typically have a bigger crop, it's supply and demand. Bigger crop, there's maybe a bigger supply. If we don't have that demand uh, from other countries, you know, got to remember, 96% of the people in the world don't live in the United States. And that's why trade and, and, and being able to sell to other countries actually increases that demand and increases our price. So with that financial stress, prices are low now. The best way to increase those prices is more demand worldwide. What can we look at for this next year in demand? We can look at the, the fact that, that there's growing economies, certainly Asia is one of those places, not only do they want more calories, but they want better calories. So places like Vietnam, certainly Japan, China have been great markets and want to continue to provide them. We can grow more than we need and they would like our products. Technology, the fact with biotechnology, and the fact that we need to make sure that we can grow more with less. And that's what biotechnology does, is it allows us to use, and maybe it's less inputs, but it could be less water, it's better for the soil. So all kinds of things in, in agriculture. Have you been working a lot with this biotechnology? Working a lot, I mean, this is a technology that is continually changing. And that's really what we're about in agriculture, is continual improvement. You know, being, being a farmer is kind of like being a parent. You do the best job you can, but you always want to do better. And as resources, as new technology, new things are out there, we want to do continual improvement. Well, have you seen any new technology coming out or that's going to come out this next year that we should be looking at or keeping an eye on? Well, I think the biggest technology is we see what we can do in precision agriculture. The fact with GPS, global positioning, systems and the fact that you can get within less than an inch of the same place. You can do your soil analysis and then you can decide what needs fertilizer where as we replace those nutrients. And it's kind of like an inkjet printer, if you will, to where it only prints, it only puts it on where you need it. So having that technology, that computerized, the global positioning, auto steer, all important things in agriculture. Most people think Farm Fest, farm equipment, crop insurance, not everybody thinks sweet tooth. And I'm here eating ice cream made out of sweet corn. So tell us a little bit about that, why I stuffed my face with ice cream. Sweet corn uh, flavored ice cream is a long tradition here at Farm Fest with the Farm Growers Tent. Uh, mm. We've been doing it for a, a, a lot of years. Um, and the wonderful thing about mm. it is it's, it's real ice cream made with real sweet corn. Mm. Um, it's not an artificial flavor. We actually incorporate sweet corn into the mix specifically for this event every year. Really? Well, if I thought 
corn on the cob tasted this good, I'd probably eat more. We, it, it is. It's, it's really, really good. It's very, very popular. We also have cookies made with DDGs at our tent this year again. Um, again, these are products uh, that are from the ethanol industry, but we're getting food-grade DDGs, and we're making food for human consumption out of them as well. So there's lots of things that we can do with corn and the products from the corn industry that are good for people to eat. So tell me a little bit about that. There's a lot of different foods that you can make out of just corn. Right. What are some besides ice cream and cookies? Well, you know, we have the traditional things that include cornmeal and uh, you know things like tortillas. Um, but again, a lot of what we do at the corn growers are looking for new ideas, things that aren't necessarily out there that will help expand the markets for corn. And the cookies made from DDGs is from a research project that has added value to the things that corn producers grow. So what's kind of the process of finding corn or brainstorming on what you can make corn out of? A lot of this is from our research endeavors. So we put out needs assessments every other year looking for researchers that have ideas on what can I do with this product or this thing, these things that come from corn farmers. And these research ideas come from them to us. We fund the research. They, in fact, create and produce the products. So now, sweet corn ice cream really isn't a new deal, correct? It's not new. It's been around a long time, and it's not something that's available all the time in the stores, but it is a treat for us here at Farm Fest. That's true, and it's great to go along with the farming theme, right? Correct. And again, it involves people in bringing agriculture all the way into our sweet tooth. Ah, and I have a big one of those. So now, infusing flavor, did you guys think maybe we shouldn't make it taste like corn, or what was kind of that process? No, I think that's always kind of the thing. Because we're the corn growers, we want that to be part of what we're doing. It's not just that we have free ice cream. We want that ice cream to be a representation of what we do. That's very true. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to say about the process or anything like that? No, but it's a wonderful day here at Farm Fest. We just invite everybody to come out and uh, just pay attention to what your corn farmers are doing for you. And it's a great way to cool down free ice cream, and it's sweet on my tongue. Good for you. That's it for us this week on Compass. Join us next week as we're back in the studio with Lassie and our host. Thanks for tuning in.